Thank you. Uh, it's okay. Can I call this? Put the thing. Put this in the book. Put 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 I design my company, but uh, it's all my own personal capacity. And with that out of the way, we can uh, go to the, the content. By the way, I have been told many times that I speak very, very fast. So if I lose any of you, feel free to just raise your hand and ask me to slow down, okay? So, uh, I hope you're offended. Uh, yeah, people do it uh, to me and, and I really like it because, yeah, I just speak very fast and over the years, somehow I wasn't able to slow down. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Kerry. Uh, and I'm really happy to be, back to be here in the NUS today. Uh, I'm happy because this is my alma mater. I first did my Bachelor of uh, Electrical Engineering in 1998. That's like nearing 20 years ago, I have no idea. Then in 2006, I came back to do my Master of Computing with MCOM. So I was just uh, sharing with Raven and Macamia that at that point in time, MCOM was even here. He was at the School of uh, Science, of Faculty of Science. How many of you were out at that point in time? No way, in Windows 6. Oh, I'm like, I already. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask that, but I thought it might be really offensive. But, uh, okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, I think you guys will be there. Then, Windows 6, then, uh, so it's been 18 years since I came back to a classroom setting like this, and, uh, and yeah, just very nice to see all of you. Feel free to stop me along the way with your questions, and if I can answer them, I answer. If not, I'll try to find an answer somehow. But, uh, yeah, just really good. To be back with you guys. So, I also want to thank the New York Cycles Club for having me, uh, Pratanya, and uh, also Raymond for hosting me today. It's really nice. And also to all of you, young people, for sacrificing your Friday evenings. I'm very surprised that you all just be here. You know, normally go to some place to party or have fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's good. Yeah, you have a free food anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when I was asked to talk about this, right, the one, one of the questions I think of mine was would this be relevant to you? Because um, the work that I was primarily involved in is usually about porting a legacy 30-year, 40-year code base to the web. And most of you, when you graduate, well, most may, most of you not work on legacy code. So I'm not sure why you're staying back on this talk. <laughs> in any sense, if this applies to you, somehow you end up in Autodesk or okay, AutoCAD or some other Adobe or whatever, right? Uh, hopefully this will prove helpful to all of you. And for the next talk, right, in the next, uh, Maybe 25 minutes. Uh, we just want to share or know more about the template challenges that come in porting legacy code and some of the initiatives and solutions that the other cat team did to overcome that. Okay. Uh, the outline of the talk for today some history, some background on why we did what we did, the solutions, and straight away we'll dive into the technical so called issues that confront us the moment we try to embark on this very ambitious plan of porting all the cat to the web. Rewriting versus cost compilation, synchronous versus async IO, performance expectations. What is the difference in the way users perceive a desktop application and a web application, and how it uh, so called translates to the way you architect and program your code? And finally, what is web assembly? And also the initiatives that I think did to so called improve the performance of web assembly uh, over the years. Uh, just a short check how many of you know of web assembly? At least heard the term before. Oh, so many, okay. Nice, nice. Yeah, when I first did it in 2017, uh, most people did not care about that, but okay, it's good, good to hear about that. Okay, hey, some background. Um, suppose you are in a company money down to work till you graduate, and the boss comes to you and say, We have this test application, and we need to create or generate a larger reach among our customers. And of course, the first thing to think of is, okay, everybody is on web and mobile today. And if you want to reach out to those customers, you will have to somehow watch them or migrate them over to web and go out. But then the question will then be, um, how do you do it? And there's some very uh, architecture questions that we ask already. Do you then decide on a client server architecture or do you have to place everything on the client side? So the, the implications are of course immense. If you speed it up, then naturally you can get, get it to production faster. 
But you put everything on the client side, right? Then the so called migration effort will be more uh, involved. Although if you put everything on the client side, then actually the performance will be faster as well. Okay, uh, I know this might be a bit um, too, too deep in, but along the way, you can always visit this later if it's interesting to you. And secondly, uh, we need to understand that AutoCAD is a very complex beast. So there's many, many things in AutoCAD, uh, the UI, graphics engine, uh, or whatever, there's just so many things to talk about. And in order to do the plotting effectively, right, uh, that, that immense code base has a lot of implications on how we decide on whether to rewrite or to compile and also to address some of these challenges. So over here, right, you see this uh, flow. The flow was intentionally put there to show that we have chosen or tried to plot from desktop to mobile and web. Why? Because as of today, right, uh, for those of you who have tried WebAssembly, how many of you have tried to compile the WebAssembly? Oh, okay, good. Yeah, if you compile, right, then uh, you'll find that it's hard to debug it, right? It's only to compile, it's not to debug. And therefore, it will be easier to first compile to web. Oh, sorry, first compile to mobile, then you can compile to web. Then you will make it, the debugging experience much more easier, you know, because when you move to mobile, right, what are the mobile platforms available today? What do you have? Android and iOS, right? Correct. Most of them are closely compliant. So once you put the closely, right, you can easily compile to web which uh, Japanese users can script and read. So that's just some of the points that uh, we need to be aware of. And this slide always makes me feel nostalgic. If you look at this day, it's 2009. Most of you were born at the time. 2009. Okay, just a trip down memory lane for all of us here. And it's so important to learn from history because from there we can learn from some of the mistakes that we made or did not make as well. Uh, we chose to write from scratch. But during that time, there was this language called Flash. I'm not sure if you guys know about it, uh, by Adobe. We worked in 2009. In 2013, right, uh, we started to rewrite using C. And we had this uh, very interesting multi stage compilation process whereby we first used Tangible to compile to Java. And after that, GWT, Google Web Toolkit, compiled JavaScript. Because at that point in time, only JavaScript runs on the web, right? Yeah, at that point in time. So it was a very tedious process of rewriting and compilation. And in 2013, that was what we did. The uh, performance was affected, development speed was affected. And finally, in 2015, right, we decided that, okay, we can't do it anymore because it was just too expensive. And what we did was we cost compiled on the open source code. And what did we use to cost compile? We use this tool called Enscripten, okay? So what Enscripten does in 2015 was that you cost compile C++ code into ESNGS. ESNGS is a very clever invention, is that it takes a subset of JavaScript. And because um, JavaScript has certain issues with performance that makes it unpredictable, but suffice to say that ESNGS, right, uh, because of its uh, so-called uh, nature, the fact that it's a subset of JavaScript, is able to fully optimize most of the so-called JavaScript engine in the browsers at the point in time. So performance was faster and was most importantly predictable. So if you're running, let's say, a um, Mathematica engine in the browser at the point in time, SNGS was preferred to so-called pure JavaScript. And then in 2017, right, we have WebAssembly or wasn't for short. So we immediately uh, ported, we use, it was the treatment, and we use this tool called binary name that will then optimize what we had into the WebAssembly module. And post recently up to today, right? Uh, my team is still doing uh, enhancements on, on web assembly. So, uh, some of these things like dynamic linking, uh, if you work on desktop, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept dynamic linking, uh, exception handling, and wasn't speed. Now, for those of you who hear about the desktop, you'll be surprised that why do we need to work on exception handling? It's always in there in C applications. So, the issue now is that when we first started working in 17, which is like seven years ago, a lot of things were not there. We didn't have Especially in we don't have the linking, which are like everyday desktop uh, so called uh, features. And also, we didn't have a, what do you call that? Uh, well, so we I mean, just P tracks or CD that, that you guys can take for granted on desktop, we just didn't have. So, we slowly, slowly uh, put it there, and we really need it, then we we'll contribute to the standardization efforts to get it up. So, that's how uh, we end up where we are. And just a bit of uh, info on the OCAP code base, some of you have. AutoCAD. I don't know uh, what are your thoughts on it, but it's massive, okay, and it's old. Like, the first version was written in the 70s, and I'm sure you are not going to remember Because it is like 70, but I'm not going to remember yeah. So, so it's like really old, more than 40 years. And, and the issue is that you get certain um, programming paradigms that 
cannot be supported by bullying. And for good reasons, the web has designed itself to not support certain desktop content so they can be fast and responsive. And anyway, that's the reality that we were in. And secondly, it's massive, right? 15 million lines of code and still growing. So uh, can you imagine the impact that it has on your build time, on the cost compilation? Most people cost compile very small, small applications on the embedded systems, you know, like, like, like maybe you're doing some IOD stuff, you cost embedded very small code. A few thousand lines, this is 15 million, and it's still growing, see? So the impact on build time, and the impact on startup time, not so much the runtime, but on, on so-called your, your, your startup time, right? There's a lot of impact on your customer success. At the end of the day, you're always on customer success, you know, like, like how you engineering reach out to them. So it's one point. And thirdly, it's uh, constantly changing. You have a 50 million code base, it's already tough to support it, and it's changing. So if you rewrite from scratch, can you imagine how much you have to start with? You need one team to add, another team to port it over to JavaScript. Uh, which is uh, not really sustainable for any company in the long run. So, and finally, it's Windows based. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys still do Windows programming nowadays, maybe you do, but, but if you go to just Android, right, which is more tuned towards the POSIX side of programming, then what will happen is that all this Windows API will need to be poorly filled to be so called uh, on the web, the JavaScript equivalent. So, so this is also an effort needed. Uh, yeah. So, with that in mind, right, uh, the key lesson that we learned over the years is that uh, regarding from scratch, it's not sustainable. If you have a legacy education and you want to very quickly uh, port it to mobile or the web to reach a, last, a larger customer base, too, it's very hard to rewrite unless it's a very small. And even if you rewrite, you'll take a lot of effort to maintain it. You need one team for mobile, one team for web, and in mobile, you have iOS and Android. <laughs> so, so that is a lot of money, yeah. and, and then power is expensive nowadays. So, so uh, cross population seems to be more sustainable, and, and uh, so issues with rewriting is just too slow. And secondly, there's no need to be in the view. If you have a polyline of the right? you expect to have the same values on mobile, on web, on desktop, right? And customers demand that. If you don't have a polyline, behave differently on, on desktop compared to mobile. This is a visual fidelity issue, and we get a lot of trouble for that. So, and when you rewrite, then the problem is that then the developer might make a mistake, might make a bug, even to the best of his intention, and so that will be catastrophic. And of course, it's too expensive, right? Code is changing, and then you have to keep on like, keeping up with it, and after all, you look at, you know, you have this story, you know, so they just edited. So, so, so there's some realities that why we don't rewrite from scratch uh, for, for large uh, code base like AutoCAD. Okay, the first of the few technical issues I would just like to touch base on today. Um, might not get a chance to go very deep, but just to uh, give you guys a favor. Most legacy C applications are written synchronously. You know, a lot of IO costs are synchronous. But when you go to the web, for good reasons, we do not allow that on the main track. You can do the right forget on the main chat. So for those of you who have forget on the web, you are aware of that. So this is really an issue because the moment you fire that the synchronous call on the main chat is going to air out and your app dies. So there are a few ways to go about it. Uh, you can rewrite everything, which is again, as I said, too expensive, not feasible. And the worst thing is that your third parties have to rewrite as well. <laughs> you only need to get your own guys to, to do this. It's nothing to get your customers to do this, which they were not uh, most of it obliged. So, so we didn't rewrite. And the other uh, so-called way to ground is to move the web together. But when you move, right, then you bring with your, with yourself a whole set of problems, like first of all, a singular score, right, to invalidate your on message handler. So for those of you again, sorry if you are familiar, if you're not familiar with programming, I'm a little bit behind, but in JavaScript, right, there's this thing called an on message handler that allows the web worker to receive events. But the moment you block it, right, the control is not returned back to the browser and you can't receive events anymore. And because of that, right, all your SCA APIs will break down. No, you will not be able to use them. And the other way to work on it is to use shared memory. Why shared memory today, uh, because of what happened in 2018, like there are a lot of security issues. And therefore, to use it, you have to set the necessary screen readers. Setting them is, okay, not too much of a hassle, but the more you set the screen readers, right, there's another set of limitations that are imposed on you to make sure that you know, your security is there. So, so again, it's not as straightforward to port something from desktop to, to web. Almost as clear to port the synchronous API to the web, or to use a, sorry, uh, to use async APIs in the web, you know, in, uh, in the context of a login call. So, so I hope uh, we, we, we get a sense of some of the issues that are involved here. Any questions or comments before I go on and on again? Are yes. third parties here like plugins or something? Like uh, could be like developers, they, they, they develop them. So, so they, they, my understanding is that they use some APIs that are, you know, the synchronous kind of stuff. So, so yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, so maybe when you are school, it's not that apparent, but a great question. Sometimes when you go out and 
you already have an ecosystem using your application, which is great, you, know, you want to work towards that, you have a platform, you need to think a lot about your, your third parties. How do you generate a developer community, encourage open source, and that kind of stuff to, to make the app go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a simple example on why synchronous APIs is no on the web. Uh, this is a very simple open cascade point, C API. You want to draw a line, what do you do? You, you call the get point API, wait for the point to come back. But when you're waiting for the point to come back, right, do you proceed? You don't, right? On the desktop, right now you wait. But on the web, you do that. You, you buy it and then you just sort of like, register the callback with the browser, and when the point comes in, the callback is called. But not for the, the desktop, that's why we hang there. You wait for the first point, wait for the second point, blah 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 blah. Until your calling line is completed with the enter command and then you go off. So you imagine the problem that you get on the browser programming, right? On the main How are you going to get past this on, on the on the what you call that on the browser? So after many iterations, right? Um, what do you call that? With all this so-called synchronous talking, every shared memory, every specter and now which are two very uh, so-called very uh, serious so-called security vulnerabilities that we experienced many in, right? So we can, we set on this what we call a SYNC SHR and service worker solution that uh, if you guys are interested, you can talk more. So basically what happens is that we do not use shared memory, but we use synchronous SHR. Uh, so, so what synchronous SHR is, does is that it actually sends a request from my worker to what we call a service worker. Okay? And this service worker right, will then intercept all messages from the main thread or the UI thread in. And when you just that, right, you will then do a SHR scan, uh, sorry, the call will then resolve, return back to the JavaScript. And from that, all the can do is processing of the input messages. And after that, right, it will then just very simply fire a post message back from the web worker to the URL track. So what we have here is that from the main track to the web worker, right, we have to go through this hassle of pushing the service worker and going back. But from my worker to URL track, we don't have to do that. Because there are no blocking calls in the URL track anyway. So, so that's why uh, communication from web worker to the main thread is easy, but on main thread to web worker, we are sort of stuck with this. You know, up to the day, you know. uh, We can so called get rid of this using uh, shared memory, but that is a bit of a hassle with the so called security layers. But there's another solution that I'll talk about later on. And finally, then uh, when all the receives the messages on the web worker, he can then does do his own uh, so called graphics processing, uh, displaying stuff. So, so this is the solution that all the uses today for our so called. Uh, Web validation. Any questions, comments? What protocol is this in which communication? What protocol? Uh, this is SHR. SHR is SMLHTP request. It's just an SHR. Yeah. So, yes, HTTP. Yeah, it's HTTP. Yeah. So, it was uh, a quick question. It is not what it's supposed to do. <laughs> the service worker is designed for fast startup application. But one of the so called uh, features of the service worker is able to intercept SHR calls. So because we were in 2018, they pulled out shared memory the last minute before we released. So what we did was we uh, had no choice but to so-called um, reach out to the home team and they realized they came back to us with this pattern and that's what we did to, to overcome the problem of uh, having a synchronous application out with uh, so-called the main chat in, in the browser. So, so, so. Uh, quite ingenious, not, not the best way to about it. But in our performance measurements, we didn't measure this slow down, so it's it was okay. It's okay if not see anything. Yeah. Uh, some of you here might be interested in our build framework. Uh, in case you guys want to build a so called uh, web assembly application for yourself, we use uh, WSL, the Windows of the so called Linux environment. And after that, uh, we have CMake. CMake is so called like a build file generator. We generate the Ninja flavor for CMake, and from there, uh, not, not, not sorry, not Ninja Bible or Cine, but we just generate Ninja build files. And Ninja will then call the necessary and scripted build commands to generate our browser modules. So these are also our build facts. This is down for your reference. Yeah, so I mentioned that you know uh, customers expect test applications to sort of work differently from web. And one of the expectations that we are very Concerned about instead of startup performance, simply because startup performance is a start of what we call the user experience bubble, right? Right? If user like you look for no user experience, when you open a page, you click, you click. Let's say you ten clicks inside also. Which clicks are the most important? The first two or last two? The first two. 
the first two are because you, you don't the first two are bad, then user drop off. But your first two are good, right? Three or four good, you hook the user in. Even if your last two are bad, they might most of it hang on just to finish up the workflow. So the first two is most important. And on that part, right? The uh, users traditionally can tolerate longer startup times. You go to work and you're putting for your you know, your company and you are we um desktop application, most people don't talk about startup timing. Mean, they, they don't mind if your desktop application startup slower. But you're working on on web, uh, people generally expect web pages to load very fast. Like Google search is like I think less than half a second web or few 10, 30 milliseconds. Uh, I, I saw the numbers by book off. But by much people expect a very fast amount of time. And if you have AutoCAD, right, which is uh gigantic beast running on the web, how long do you think you think will start up? When it was first released, it took 25 seconds. How many people will stay for 25 seconds to produce that application? <laughs> so so we 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 potentially end up in a situation where right, you you spend tons of money, a lot of effort to pull it on the web and people don't even use it because they get so uh imitated waiting for you to load and they just bail out. <laughs> so and there are many reasons why it's so long, like um uh, users machine may be slow, you know, the the laptop the core i5, it's core i7, the CPU is weak. Network time is it is seventeen, right? When you are working on the web, right? And you are streaming data over like data files, uh, you have to be very sensitive to the size of the memory and the kind of caching mechanism and something that you use. And thirdly, uh, like I say, okay, it's a speaker, right? So, so uh, yeah, there's many reasons why it's so long and, and it has a very negative impact on our power burning success. So we spend a lot of time to make it good and and this is startup time, uh, we also talk about runtime performance, and the reason is because some AutoCAD drawings or weeks for short are very complex. I mean, there's some customer tweaks can go to one gigabyte. Can you make it a customer, right? And he wants to open up this one gigabyte drawing. <laughs> How long will it take? You take, I don't know, an eternity to send it over the wire. That will take an eternity to process it, and then it comes down. You, you get the picture, right? So, so these are some issues that we get on porting from the desktop to the web that we have to address in order to ensure the success of our application. So, uh, this is where exactly comes in. I again don't have time to, to, to score that very deep dive, but just to give all of us a high level overview of what it does. So uh, I took this definition from the WebAssembly oh, website. It just says uh, WebAssembly abbreviated version, right? Uh, it's a binary instruction format. It's a stack based virtual machine and it's designed as a portable target for compilation of high level languages and when deployment on the web for client and server applications. The last part is important because even if any 17 when first came out, they were really thinking of server applications. At that point in time, right, people were just thinking of, of uh, client, but at this point in time, we get a server. So that was quite a far sighted of the standards committee. Right? So we just unpacked some of these terms uh, to help us understand WebAssembly a little bit more. So WebAssembly is a VM, or whether it was a VM. So what this means is that it's a compulsion habit. We typically don't call it WebAssembly worst, but you can even do I know of. Uh, one guy who does that for, for fun, I know. <laughs> he has four and close in web assembly. But that, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine. You know. but, but we most people, most normal human beings, we call it C++, we call it Rust, and it calls compile into it. And some examples, um, do we guys use Java? Yes, Java, okay. Java, uh, LVM, they code. So these are some of the intermediate so called representations that we use. And the matter is, is that uh, it is no longer. Because it's portable and it's virtual, right? It's no longer confined to the browser. But now it's a job assembly, it is confined to the browser. But you, you can think about it, right? Different embedders can actually so called um, run web assembly by providing their own cell and boss. But I'm not sure if you guys have called uh, the web assembly system interface. It's called WASD. So so different embedders or runtime, like wasn't time, wasn't one, right? They just provide the runtime on desktop, provide it to uh, what do you call it? The, um, uh, and you can run AutoCAD. If you provide the right set of interfaces, right, you'll then be able to, to get it to work. So that's a, that's a cool thing for, 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 for being a uh, VM. And secondly, it's uh, really an instruction set detection. The uh, instructions are there. And it uses a linear memory model to different types, like integer, I32, float, and 64. Uh, it is essentially a stack machine. The instructions are executed in order, and instructions can be really on the stack versus it being an ESD. So it's a stack machine, and there are different types of instructions like load, store, control flows. Okay, a very simple, very very simple function to show how the stack machine operates. Okay, uh, 
Ali jim kaj smo si pa spravili. A mi jih dovolj se predamo vse. A pa je da se stegi na indoprimita e pa ljudi tudi. A da pa ni ni kodr vaj tis da pa ni on kod fo. A li vej vzem di in šakšen sta ni gado kjo, a tudi tu kost, a tudi tu e. And then after that, uh, the wall's representation, which is the textual representation of Zendi, is on the second column, and we show what you get the stack. Um, yeah, the little gets the two parallel, pushes it to the stack, can be any value, then the D. After that, cons 42 again, pound 42 on the stack again, the F just adds up. And get the no 42. Okay, this is a very simple application. It goes really, really complex. Uh, once you have a full flash AutoCAD source code, but this is just to give us sense of what's happening. And over the years, right, they have done a lot of work to improve the both the runtime as well as the startup performance of WebAssembly. Right? So, if today you want to use WebAssembly as a company, I think there's a higher chance of success compared to what I did seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, there's really a higher chance of success. They, in terms of the startup performance, right, we have this thing called LeapDog, uh, which is a very smart concept. Even if you don't use it, it's good to internalize it and use it wherever you are. So, instead of compiling code to one tier of the optimized code, right, you compile it to two tiers. And you have the optimized tier, the less optimized tiers. And what happens is that the less optimized tier will quickly compound faster or slower. The less optimized tier. The faster, right? Now, obviously, it's faster because they took out a lot of changes. And when you have this less optimized tier, you just show it, present to the user so that the user can get to enjoy the application faster. Although the code runs slower, but they get to see faster. In the meantime, what do you think they're doing in the background? They will compound the optimized tier, right? You go on and on and on. And when it's ready, right, uh, depending on your algorithm, they will switch the code in. So it's a very fast, fast, fast way of uh, doing this stuff, right? that, that this time when you try to optimize the performance, right, maybe you can return tiers and present the less optimized tier so, so that customers get to enjoy the application and in the background, you can compile what is uh, more optimized. So and then after that, they did GDP caching. Why is GDP caching? So they took this one step further, uh, the home thing, right? instead of just compiling code, whether it's optimized or not optimized, they cache the compound optimized memory. So this time you, you, you go in and gain, right? You no longer need to compound. The fastest code that, that sometimes is a code that don't need to be compound, right? So they cache it and then after they run the code, uh, then this time you go in. So HTTP caching uh, goes there. And with these two so-called uh, enhancements, right? The start performance uh, improves tremendously in the book cap. There are lots of things that we did. So these two really help. And in one time, um, I'll just briefly talk on GSD again because that was a big win for us as well. In JavaScript, for the longest of time, we did not have 32 bit inches. Okay? And that was a problem because in web assembly, they support 64 bit inches. How do you think it was, if you were the so called in the service community, right? Or you're looking in Chrome, how will you support 64 bit integer in web assembly with 32 bit integer in JavaScript? What will you do? And it's not a case, actually. Like, what will you do? 64 bit, you want to convert 32 bit, what will you do? You just yeah, just think that way. Right? I think you guys can do it. The higher order bit and lower order bits. Right? And then all you do is you try to find a way to, to return the so called, the, the, maybe the lower order bits. And the higher order bits you start somewhere so that your JavaScript code can pick it up again. Right? And it's just a, a logical flow to, to get it to work. But it's easy to cover this idea, but what do you think is impact performance? Every API call has to go through this no, to JavaScript. So it's expensive. So, and, and, one of the things that they, they did was that they finally introduced 64 bit in JavaScript. They did with all this model they code. So again, one performance was uh, getting nearer to uh, so called the desktop platform. And secondly, exception handling. There were no exception handling web assembly when we first started. So again, they, they had to make use of a lot of uh, JavaScript stuffs to make it happen. So when it came out, it was also a big win for AutoCAD because AutoCAD is a legacy application that uses a lot of exception handling code in it. Yeah, so, so these two are big wins for us. For features and simply, um, well, I mean, if your application uses a lot of parallel computations, I think it's self explanatory than the top right. Uh, okay, so what are some of the initiatives that we did? Because we were so concerned with startup planning, we contributed a lot to so called the direct linking of the uh, top scripted on how it works. And my colleague, Albert Sibosi, also came up with uh, this thing called Profile Guided Componentization, which I will share more later. And finally, it wasn't split, it's just the uh, evolution of what we did for this PDC. Remember what we talked about before just now, right? We actually so called combined the two tiers so that the, the, so the, the, the slower so the slower code actually gets to be presented faster. But what if you don't have compiled the code in the first place? That would be the best, right? So his idea was simply this. What if in your application, right? You have a way to find out uh, 
the code that you normally run in most scenarios. You know, like what the scenarios that your users are most interested in, and then you have a way to identify them, and from there you put them into this thing called the, uh, uh, not this thing, <laughs> you put them into the hot module that you will load, and the rest of it you chunk them, you chunk them into the secondary module. So your code becomes very small. Yeah, the code size reduction that we got for doing this is very, very significant. And because of that, our startup time was faster as well. And the way we did it was that we had three stages. The instrumentation phase, we will actually inject our logging functions into our web as a new module. And from there, right, we will identify a set of training scenarios. It's a bit like machine learning. I mean, not, not really that, I know it's just a like, thing to say, but, but it's not really that. What we do is we identify the scenarios, we run it, we just log it, and these functions, right, we will then have a profile log that we will then use for splitting. The functions that in the log will split in a whole module, those are not a log, we just chunk them in the whole module. Okay? And because of that, again, uh, the startup time was very significantly improved. And we have two iterations. The first thing was done in LVM. Do you guys know LVM? Uh, of course, it's, it's a it's compiler that we use for, for the that supports client to do anything. It's LVM. And after that, right, uh, we found some issues with splitting in LVM, and then we move on to manually then. So just to make this clear, this is what we did. Uh, in one time, when the user loads AutoCAD initially, right, on the first time, what we do is we will compile and load the hot version, and we'll go on to the, in the background, what we do, we compile the, the code, which is significantly bigger. Yeah, the hot version is very small, but the code is very big, and it'll take a long time to compile. And it will come to a point in time where the user triggers operation, they will have a missing function, right? So that we are in trouble because once we have missing function, you try to go on, it's either you crash or you bring in the, the so called the function from the core module. So we block and then uh, we will wait for the core module to compile and from there, right, once it's loaded and link it, we will then call the function from the core module uh, and, and proceed. Okay? Most of the time, right, uh, what we've seen today is that the core module generally will compile in time. Yeah, as in, the, the training is sufficient to, to sustain so called the user for a lot uh, period that is long enough for the code version to come down. So it 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 points out how good your training scenarios are. The better the training scenario, the more time you buy for yourself, and therefore more time for the code version to come down, and less likely that you will enter a missing function detected before the compilation is completed. So that's how the game is big. You know, you balance the training scenarios with the compilation time. And also after the code was is compiled, we compile the full version, the full okay. And why? Because the full version is still faster than the hot and cold together. So we compile it and, um, and for some single loads, we just put the full version that is fully cached. Yeah, so that's what we did. Yes? So there is like uh, several optimization modes. Correct. Is it controlled by the browser or your program? Uh, we have no say on the uh, optimization level. The browser controls it. Then what's the difference between the code and the whole version? Uh, the, in terms of optimization, they are the same. We just speed them up into Functions that are normally used by only can users for the hot, and functions that are not normally used by only users in the cold. And what's the difference with the four? Cold and cold. Uh, cold and cold. Cold is everything. There's no speaking. So we have three modules in OCAD today the hot and the cold and the full. So, uh, for example, there's like 100 functions in OCAD, right? 10 is normally used, 10 will put in hot, 90 will put in cold, but 100 is in the full. So the remaining like 10 is in the cold. Uh, everything is in the full, everything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, now when we run on subsequent mode, it's always a full. Because when you have a hot and a cold, how do you think the hot and cold talk to each other? They are elsewhere, right? and they'll be true if I use the table calls. But that's still slower. You get I mean? you, having two modules talking to each other will never be as fast as one module talking to itself. You're always faster to talk to yourself, but they're not going to I will see that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we talk to your friend, say, Hi, what's the name? You wait for the guy to respond kind of to you, but uh, I'm just kidding, you know, right? You can. That's why the full is always preferred. You can only need the full after it's compiled and cash. Yeah. Uh, if I reach the missing function, I have to wait for the code. Yes. Code. Yes. That's why it's, it's essential that your training scenarios, right, can buy enough time for you for the whole version to fully compile and do it. Yeah. The whole process of getting a web assembly binary into working code is not so simple. There's compilation, there's instantiation, and after that, caching. Yeah, okay. so, so this is just a very uh, so called stripped down version of what happens. And the question is about yeah. the cache. What, what is exactly the cache? Uh, I think they cache so called the uh, compile binary. If I remember correctly, it should be the machine code, the machine dependent code on the yeah. right. uh, they, they wouldn't be caching the, the so called the binary itself because it's already cached over the wire. So they should be caching the so called the machine compile code. Right? 
um, specific to the architecture of the CPU, if I remember correctly. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. How long does it take to think about the uh, I don't know the latest numbers, but I think it's generally fast enough that, that it compost even before the user logs in to the application. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the latest, so I don't want to give a top number, but you know, like every application now, you have to see the page and you log in, right? And then you get in. But now it's so fast that you don't look at and you can change the username and password. So in, most of the time, uh, the hot is already in compost and go there. So if they go into the file manager and open up, Okay, right? Any technology, there's no lag on the engine side. Yeah, there's no lag. Yeah. Right. So, so of course, browsers have their enhancements, uh, which is what uh, the first person was thinking about. Optimizations, deep talk, HTTP caching. Then we did our own stripping down the module, second one, to, to have that kind of performance. Yeah. And also important, because if you don't have this hot code splitting, right, what happens when as time goes fast? You think you add more code or you reduce more code? Most of the ML code, right? Sometimes we reduce when we finally, you know, realize that now we're just getting too slow. <laughs> but most of that, there's a lot of code adding. What happens when you add more code in your application? Your value you get larger. What happens with a lot of time? Yeah. You, right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. it blows up. So even if you don't do it today, right? You make five software, it's going to blow up to a point where a big application is going to take too long to start up. And more of the the thing about PGC is that you freeze the startup time over here. Most of the time, right, uh, the functions that we get, most of the time, will not contribute to the whole module. You just go to the whole module, see. Because new features generally may not be uh, frequently used. So, so look, that's where. Uh, so, it's not just about today that we reduce the startup time. So, in the future, we will, know, uh, we will not be so susceptible to new code as added over here. Yeah. So, I think you would collect elementary data from users and use that to generate what is called. Uh, we don't because if you want to generate television models, that's what you have to do. You have to instrument your code. Yeah, how how slow would that be? <laughs> Every single other function you have to inject as something logging to it, that is not possible. You need something more to if you want to instrument function level, right? You have to need something more to do it rather than uh, instrumentation of code itself. Do you know which part is what you can bother to work? Uh the training scenarios. We run scenarios uh, locally. Yeah, so so yeah, the training scenarios. Stage two. Quick question, quick question. Yeah, at least uh, you guys are not falling asleep. Uh, okay, so what did we migrate to binary end? Well, I mean, uh, before you finish this, you first have to understand what is LDM, but anyway, just to be for me, it's some sort of compiler framework. And the problem with LDM is that if you speak at what they call the LDM IR big code, so then what do you have? You end up with two big codes, right? And then from there, you have to compile that into two separate version modules. How do you think that will time? A lot, a lot. Yeah, because it takes a lot of time to compile a production ready version well, module. And not only the debug codes. Debug codes are very really fast to compile, but you compile a production code right? it can take very long to compile. And even if uh, the powerful developer machines that you have, right, it can take a long time to get it done. So, so, so what I thought was like, okay, it's not going to work, it's just a slow compile. Also, the full compiler optimizations that are available, right, are not running on the full to code. It's running on separate so-called uh well example modules, which is finally again. And therefore I I reached out the home team and I said, no, this is not working. We, we have to collaborate. And, and what we did was that we instead of using LVM IR to speed the code, right, we would actually just try the full bosom and then from there we use binary to speed it. And because uh, we speed only after we get the full bosom, so called the, the full range of optimizations in binary has really been applied on the bosom module. So, so we don't have to worry that we are losing stuff on there. And also, uh, the build time is much faster, right? Because instead of building two web assembly modules, just building one. Even though it's bigger, but, uh, yeah, but, but the build time has also been uh, so significantly improved when we did it this way. And uh, also, better optimizations. All these are, sorry, all these are open source uh, code. You go to the Enscripten website, right? You will be able to. I wrote this thing, uh, that's not with the connection, sorry. Yeah, you go to the Scripter website, you'll be able to get and all the information about this uh, was a speed and scripter is a fully open source feature. There's nothing uh about this. Okay. Okay, the one the one thing I asked this one, I think my time is one, yeah, it's really 50. I just focus on the new one, JavaScript promise integration. Uh remember I talked just now about how it was 
painful to get a so called a synchronous desktop application to run a uh, web a sync API. Right? So what this guy does is that he has a way right to allow you to run a, a sync that like, like, synchronously. So he does some engineering uh, smart engineering background to hold so called the, the API. And only by the API completes execution right then you return control back to you. So this is a big game changer for the cat because we there is times where we have no choice but to use all these async APIs. And in order for us to do it, we have to do a lot of workarounds to make it work. And some of these workarounds uh, happen in very hot code. Because they are caught many times. So, so when this comes around, we can then we go for these workarounds and then we will then be able to treat an async API synchronously in, uh, in the web. So just here is one thing that, uh, that, that is, has a lot of promise for legacy application porting as well. Yeah, the rest I think I've talked to them uh, just now, so there's no need to go in depth. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, that's all I have for today. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, for the splitting, right, you split the front four, right? Uh, is there any reason why you split the two categories? Or is there like, some other way, like, instead of splitting two, like, you can prioritize it for most people like this, or three categories for the three? Okay, okay. You can decide to change the like two, three, four, but we, we didn't even know it would work at the beginning, so. Just like two. <laughs> but, but that's a good point. You can have three and made like uh, functions that users will have to use to up, functions that they use for maybe uh, more common scenarios and the third phase for, for functions that are not so common. So you could do that. It's a good point. You could enhance it to do it. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah, very good, good suggestion. Yeah. But then if yeah. that's the case, then how would you prioritize that? I mean, obviously, you will go the, you do the whole ones first. Mm. But then how? Will you like, how do you know which one of them? So you just compile like order of like which one is more commonly used as more commonly used. Yeah, more commonly used. But then the case that would there be a scenario that like, let's just say, that, like, um, function two or function two, two or function three, is it more commonly used as commonly used? But the user makes a call from here and this doesn't compile. So, um, what do you say? Yeah, I think I'll say it in the end, but generally in the training scenarios, right, we know so called the uh, load flows that the users are more interested in. You know, because our temperature down us. So from there, right, we just uh, use the most common flows, and then is where we design our training scenarios, and the functions that are needed will be there. So, so uh, yeah, we, we, we don't have a challenge with the so called the, the type of flows that users use. We know what they, what they do down there, and maybe for the first few what they can The challenge is that because what we get is so complicated, and different joints can trigger different functions. So it's very difficult to capture everything. So why not we just try to capture maybe uh, the majority of users out there? I think it's very difficult to capture hundred percent of the workflows that users will find in the world because Autocad is just so complicated and there are also timing issues. Yeah, we open a certain file based on certain timing, certain functions are triggered. So, so we also have to do a lot of engineering to try to account for all these uh, so called timing issues that account for the different functions there. So so what I share is the the nice the block. There's a lot of uh, Introduces the like colleagues that we put in to make it production ready. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was nice when it first came out, we were impressed with uh, not just our own internal measurements benchmark, but also with production analytics. Because like, we capture production analytics, right? Uh, how, how well the cat performs, and we capture like, you know, uh, if, what the workflows they are most interested in, uh, what the workflows they are breaking down, they are not breaking down, that they are updating like. So, that's a question, right? Yeah, yeah Neil, go ahead. Possible to pre compile it in, uh, let, let's say your development environment, and then yeah. already compile uh, by the way, so the browser to so that you yeah. can in the yes. this configuration. Uh, good question, but then will you be back in the, to the desktop world again? If you recompile, then which architecture will be compiled to? Then, like at, yeah. at runtime, it detects the architecture, then it uh, yes, and yes. it selects which one to pull. Right. But then you have to support the, the, the ARM64 and the i x 6 right? Different architectures. So the development team must be able to handle that. And secondly, uh, the size of the compound binary may be prohibitive. Yeah, after you compound, I, I'm not sure, I don't measure it, maybe I showed how big is the compound module. And suppose you compound it and it gives up to 300 megabyte. And you still have to wire, even though it's compound, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot of time. And if after you compound, it's still a piece of shit. Yeah, that's why I said it's not the full cycle that I'm showing you guys. It's still initiation, initiation, sorry, initiation of the compile code. So, so after you compile, it's still initiation. And initiation, I don't know, maybe stick. 
and so it's time for So, so, uh, so that does release the 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 contribution slip to the default to the browser. But that's a question. If you know exactly like, oh, ninety nine percent of users are on this architecture, maybe you can come up. Also, it's possible. It's just that there's some practical limitation. I think it's possible. Yeah. I think it's possible. I mean, I'm not saying anything, sorry, but at least in this context, I'm sure if you, you can just grab on V8, right, the compiler engine, and compile yourself in this, you know, it's open source code. Yeah, it's open source, I'm sure. But it's a good idea, just that uh, I probably have a long and uh, really, really get up to it. When you compile, yeah, you should compile the machine code. That's what you should do. Machine code. Then, when it's machine code, you have to match the architecture that the user's machine is on. And your browser must be able to detect the architecture of that machine. So, Maybe, yeah, it's too but, but, uh, yeah. Right. But it's actually the idea to stay foundation. But the institution is still there, and the network transfer is something you have to be careful of. Okay. But by much, if the application is really fast enough, then we won't, uh, that's good, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fast enough, so, 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 yeah. So, yeah. That's a good point, that's a good point. Any other things to be better? Uh, uh, you guys are, Puppy name, but you don't know. Okay, so the splitting do? I mean, does it split the hot and cold model? Uh, yeah, LDA, right? What happens is that the. You don't mind being enjoyed Yeah, I was thinking this should I get in, but. Yeah, I mean, here's it. I think that's really a compiler technology. Compiler? Not really. Okay, I think you are doing it in the. Uh, so again, just a very high level view, I'm, I'm not very into this as well. You have your single translation in CPP, right? What's CPP? What happens when you compile the CPP? It goes into an object file, right? After that, in LVM, they have what we call, you can choose to compile it into a, what they call the LVM. Uh. Yeah, LVM, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the LVM, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to compile the LVM, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to compile the LVM, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to compile the LVM, right? Oh, how do I really argue here again? Yeah, uh, this is LVM. Yeah, apologies, I should put this down in the slide so it's easier for you guys to catch. Is this simple enough to understand? Simple, right? Any of you are familiar? What do you have here? You can go for a meal and come back, and your conversation are not complete. Because when you compile two separate types of modules, right, you're looking at running a lot of conversion passes in parallel and you know, making kind of stuff. So, what we did was that instead of doing this, we just use CPP. Uh, then we just go straight to a wasm full. Right? And by the way, this was my name, uh, by the way, and, and, uh, and scripting. And on here, right, then you do the splitting. And the reason why this is very fast is because this is no longer a full conversion phase. You already developed some decode. You just need to know the functions that encode, the functions that encode, and then you can do this and just split. You know, this is very, very fast. Yeah, so this is where the, the build time came in. Uh. So uh, I think you mentioned over here, right, the build time is lower. What about the compiler optimization that can pass? When you're optimizing these DLC functions, yeah? Okay, right. Yeah, so that, that might imply that you do some of the organizations that might be possible. Let's come to someone who has a full view of the bosom. You can like conversions, optimizations are normally better when you have the full picture as compared to just a uh, you know, part of it. So that's why uh, this is preferable compared to this. So it kind of no longer involves LLVM anymore. Um well I think it's just claim, like claim is by LVM. So but we don't do the is this thing here, the LVM IR? I think this is like a link time optimization. Optimize the link time. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> the user probably needs to think it like this, that, 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 uh, so got that, that, uh, dependent on the necessary architecture, right? But for this guy, we're just very, we're just moving functions here and then. We're not doing any linking and stuff. So, so, it's after link, but, but, uh, yeah. So, so it depends on how you define it. So, so it's, it's very simple, it's really just knowing which function you use and then moving functions in there. Then the, the genius of this, right, is in getting how to get these two models to, to speak correctly and fit in the Watson module, because the Watson module has its own specifications. So the genius of this is how you put it in the right way 
I'm pretty sure that they can talk properly after that. Yeah, that thing is, uh, has a lot of details and intricacies in it, which uh, I think the co cool did a very good job on. And then I think it's one of the few so called uh, implementations that we'll call beautiful. It's a very beautiful implementation in the way that you work. And that's why it's also fast. Yeah, the, it's a very efficient way of getting two person module top to one another. Yeah. If I were to do it myself, I tried to do something along the way and it was really clunky and uh, ugly. So, yeah, they did a much better job than me. So, everything was good. Oh, the LVM has been the that I think that can. You know, LV has been back ends for 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 different platforms, right? So the LVM back is empty backend, but really does LTO here before it wasn't respond. When it wasn't respond, right? Uh, there's a lot of things that happen. Like you know, the LVM has been back ends for 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 different platforms, even before the binary has already kicked in to run its own web of central transactions, over here we want one more to cut. Yeah, so LDO is, uh, in, in LDM is uh, way before this. Yeah. One question, so I see that the uh, web of central has like the uh, FIMD support. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, yes. Speed and uh, how do they use the document? Uh, single instruction multiple data, right? I, I'm not very clear. I shouldn't comment because I lost the details in my head. But basically, if you have Parallel data that you can, you have data that you can compute with parallel. So, so this is how you can, uh, refactor and restructure your CPD code to, to run. I think there's a certain what they call, uh, CMD, oh, it's getting dangerous, intrinsics that you can call to pump the data into your CPU to run it. So, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but the information is, is maybe here available from CMD and how to use. But I'm not sure whether the full CMD intrinsics are available on web assembly today as compared to what you have on Intel. So we got to check it out to make sure the intrinsics are covered. Uh, but that's a good point. Uh, the other one is features. Features, I'm sure you guys are familiar with features, threadings and stuff. So see the yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.